So the next topic here will provide an overview of Java thread pools. So I've talked to you about what a thread pool is in general, and now we're going to take a look at some of the thread pools that come out of the box in Java. And you see we're going to take a look at three of them. There's lots more you could have, but there are three that we will start out with. Cache thread pools, fixed size thread pools, and so-called work stealing pools. So the Java Executor Framework supports several types of thread pools out of the box. So a fixed size thread pool is one that has a fixed number of threads, as the name suggests, and they are pre-spawned and they are reused by worker tasks or tasks that are needed to be run to amortize the creation cost of threads. And here's how it works. There's a factory method in the executor's utility class called new fixed thread pool, which will create and pre-allocate a pool of threads. You can give whatever number you want to control the number of threads, but a good idea is to pick something that may be related to the number of cores on your machine. This particular call here will make the number of threads in the fixed thread pool be the number of cores. We'll see other ways to do it later. And then when there's work to do, you get a request from some client, we simply create something called a runnable, and then we tell the executor, which is this thing, to execute that request. And what it does is it puts the request in a queue, and it will process the request when one of the threads in the pool becomes available, just like the call center example we talked about. The way things work is if, if a thread is somehow terminated, in other words, maybe an exception is thrown in the task that's passed to the thread, and the, the task didn't handle the exception, the executor framework is smart enough to create a new thread and put it back to keep the number of threads in the pool at that fixed size. So it's kind of like the, the hydra. You chop off a head and another one grows back. Actually, hydra would be the wrong metaphor because two heads grow back, but uh, you get the point. Compute bound tasks, those are things that don't block on I.O., on an N core CPU will typically run best if the threads, the number of threads in the thread pool is roughly equivalent with the number of cores. It's no point if you have a compute bound job and you have N cores, there's no sense in having more than N threads because those other threads are not going to get a chance to run. You typically want to have the number of threads equal to the number of cores for compute bound tasks. IO bound tasks, however, are a different matter altogether. And to estimate the number of core, the number of threads you need on an N core CPU for IO bound tasks, you need to take a look at this formula. And I'll give you the big picture view. The goal of this formula is to try to keep the cores as fully utilized as possible. So in this formula, n is the number of cores. So we take n times the quantity 1 plus wt divided by st, where wt is the wait time. That's the amount of time the threads are blocked waiting for I.O. to complete, divided by the service time, which is the amount of time that something takes to run after the I.O. has been provided or obtained, the, 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 the data has been obtained from the I.O. device. So as you can imagine there in this formula, when WT is long relative to ST, then we're going to end up needing more threads. So if you spend a lot of time blocking, then you want to have a larger number of threads. If WT is small relative to ST, then you need a fewer number of threads because things aren't blocking very long. But this formula will help you decide what the right number of threads should be. And you might also ask the question, how the heck can you figure out what WT and ST would be? Well, you can do some kind of profiling or some kind of analysis to, to see what those values should be. So that's, that's how you determine the number of tasks on, for I.O. bound tasks for an end core process, or the number of threads to have. One of the problems you can run into if you're not careful, and we'll talk more about this later, is that if you have a fixed size thread pool that has a bounded queue, that is that the queue that's feeding this thing has a limit to it, then you can end up with deadlock. And you can read about that here in this link, thread pool induced deadlocks. I'm not going to describe it right now. I will talk about it later when we get to that part of the course in more detail. The next type of thread you can have is what's called a cached thread pool. And this will create new threads on demand in response to client workload. So you use the new cached thread pool factory method in the executor's interface or executor's uh, utility class that will create a new cached thread pool with no pre-allocated threads at all. And then when a request comes in, you say execute this request, which will either 
reuse an existing thread if it's not busy at the moment, but was created earlier, or it'll create a new thread. So this will create a bunch of threads in the pool, but it will keep them running around for a while. And the way that this works is that if a thread is created in the pool and it's not accessed for a certain amount of time, like let's say a minute, then the thread pool will automatically terminate the thread. So that way the thread will grow and shrink dynamically depending on workload. One of the nice things about the cached thread pool approach is there's no need to estimate the size of the thread pool. You don't have to guess, you don't have to estimate, you don't have to speculate, wonder, theorize, presume, infer, etc., assume. Um, but instead, it'll, it'll expand and contract automatically. However, the downside is if you have a big burst of requests that come in, then you can end up with performance overheads because you're creating all these new threads. So you're not that much different in some cases than just creating a thread per client request if a big burst of requests come in all in one fell swoop. So now you're creating lots of threads, but you're going to reuse them for some period of time. The third type of thread pool we'll talk about is, is by far the most sophisticated. I will give you a Cliff Notes version of this discussion now. We will cover it more later. This is the so-called fork join pool, and this supports work stealing queues that maximize core utilization. And it's much more complicated. I will just give you the, the high level view now. So the way you do this is you use the executor's factory method called new work stealing pool, and it'll create a pool whose size defaults to all the available cores. And then when execution occurs, when a request comes in, you, you queue it up for execution in the, in the thread pool. It's called a fork join pool. But what's different about this is that if there, that each of the threads in the pool has its own internal deck, which is a double-ended queue, and a deck means you can add and remove things from the front, and you can add and remove things to the rear. So each of these worker threads has a deck. And the way it works is that if some thread in the pool doesn't have anything in its deck, if it's not playing with a full deck, as they say, what it'll do is it'll go steal work from the end of some other thread's deck with the goal of trying to maximize utilization. So the goal is to keep this thing coming along, keep the cores running as much as possible. So the fork join pool, which uses work stealing, is designed to strike a balance between a fixed size number of threads, because we start out with a fixed size number of threads, and a variable number of threads in the pool. And it's actually possible to add additional threads under some circumstances automatically. There are also other ways to implement thread pools. The three ways we just talked about in Java, in the executor framework are by no means the only way to do things. There's other stuff that are described in various papers and books that I've written, like the leader followers model, which is good for real-time systems, and half sync, half async, which is another variation of the thread pool stuff we talked about. And if you're really ambitious, you can integrate your own implementation of a thread pool into the Java executor framework by simply extending or configuring existing interfaces or classes like the thread pool executor class or the executor service interface and so on and so forth. So you can always go above and beyond what you get out of the box to make things that are going to be customized for your particular needs. So that's the end of the overview of Java's thread pools. The key thing to come away with from this discussion were the three built-in types of thread pools, fixed thread pools, cache thread pools, and work stealing pools. And by the time this class is over, you will have a chance to play with all three of those different models. And we'll start out, I think, with fixed thread pools with assignment 2A. And assignment 2A will probably come out here shortly, as soon as you turn in.